So this um, crap webinar series, we decided to um, come up with a crap hour in lieu of our typical winter meetings. And so usually this time of year, we're hosting craps clinics and webinars, uh, or excuse me, craps clinics and agronomy meetings along with our pesticide applicator trainings. And because of COVID-19 and safety issues, um, we're following some of the policies that the Board of Regents has set forth. And we decided to try a webinar series instead. Um, so basically we're offering 12 weeks of content and I believe it's about 50 different presentations. So it's a great opportunity to pick what you're interested in um, and listen each day. We thought this way we could provide um, people with the opportunity to just pick the topics they're interested in rather than attending maybe a one or two day meeting and only you know, hearing maybe three of the 10 topics or so that you really wanted to come and hear. <clears throat> it's also a great way to reach out to people anywhere and everywhere that are interested in tuning in. So this first week we're talking about stored grains. Next week we'll talk uh, about corn topics and you can get all the details of who is speaking and when on our website. Um, then following week we'll have soybean and then wheat. Uh, we're also going to have a week on field peas, milo, and polycropping, so some of our alternative crops. Um, that'll be a really interesting week, I think. Uh, next, we'll have oats, and then soil health and cover crops, which will be uh, a great week to tune in if you're interested in those topics. That's a pretty well-rounded one. Um, followed by forages, mostly alfalfa and range forages, then sunflower, um, and understanding extension agronomy research. So that one will be a little bit different, but we're gonna focus on how to understand and read research as well as um, what research has come out this year and what might be interesting to those of you who are interested in those types of topics. Um, we'll have a weather, water, and climate week. And then we'll end this series with regulatory information and pesticide education. So the very last webinar of this series will be a live Zoom session of a private pesticide applicator training. So there are multiple ways to get your applicator training certification this year. Um, you can go online and take the test as has always been an option in the past for the past several years, or you can go to Training House and basically that's an online course you can take. It'll take you the same amount of time as the training, the full three hours, but you can pick and choose the topics that you're interested in and go at your own pace. So that's option number two. Option number three, if you need to certify or get recertified is to watch the live Zoom webinar that is at the very end of this webinar series. So that's what we're covering. We're excited to try something new. We had a great attendance yesterday and it looks like we have a pretty well attended um, session today. And it looks like Adam is back on. We'll see if he can hear us and we'll get started as soon as we can. But thanks for joining us. And for those of you, I can see if you are just joining, there's a Q&A feature at the bottom of Zoom. That's how we'll be accepting questions. And we'll have Adam field those questions at the end of the webinar today. So familiarize yourself with that. Um, and we'll also have an informal discussion when he is done with his formal presentation. I'll flash the uh, Zoom link up for you at the end and you can click that and join if you'd like to just debrief and informally chat and network with anyone else that's attending this webinar. All right. Sarah, can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. So our speaker this morning is Dr. Adam Varenhorst. And Adam has been um, with SDSU Extension since 2015. He received his bachelor's from Briar Cliff and his master's and PhD from Iowa State University. So, you know, I gave Ken a hard time yesterday about being from NDSU. We won't be as hard on you for going to Iowa, but eh, you know. We still like you. So Adam is our extension entomology uh, state specialist and I'm gonna let him go ahead and take it away. Thanks for bearing with us this morning with some technical difficulties. All right, thanks Sarah. And I apologize everyone. Uh, sometimes you set your technology up the night before, test it and the next morning nothing works. Uh, so that's what happened this morning. So uh, today I will be speaking on stored grain pests. Uh, primarily on which ones we commonly see, how to identify them, and then a little bit on how to prevent uh, from having any stored grain issues. So the reason we care so much about stored grain insects is that they can damage the grain. 
And when that happens, that means that when you go to market it, you won't receive as much money as you would if uh, the grain was norm in pristine condition or in normal condition. There's two types of damage that insects can do to the grain. The first is indirect damage and the second is direct damage. Now the direct damage uh, is probably a little bit easier to understand right away. That's when they're actually feeding on the grain itself. They're burrowing, they're damaging the kernels, the seed, and the indirect is more of an issue that happens when you have insects in the bin and they change the conditions which can lead to hot spots, mold, and deterioration over time. And so with indirect damage, a lot of times uh, it results in odors, extra dust, which can result in grain contamination and docking. Another issue with the indirect damage is just having the insects bodies present in the grain. And so when grain uh, is probed, tested, if there are insects present in the grain, that's going to result in it being docked. Uh, and like I mentioned, the deterioration of the grain is also a major issue with the indirect damage because when the insects are present, they're causing changes in moisture levels as well as just having extra debris present. Also, not so much for our crops, but it can also be an issue with aesthetics because when you open a can of almonds for the picture that's pr uh, present here, and this is something that uh, was received by us at SDSU, it's not something you want to see when you open up a can and to see uh, there to be caterpillars as well as uh, tons of webbing on your products. And so overall, these insects can really reduce quality and market value. For us, it's more of an issue with the heat damage, insect debris, the odors, and the mold growth. And so let's get into the direct feeding. Uh, so it causes damage directly to the seed as pictured here. So uh, you can see the holes. Those are from where the insects are actually feeding. Now, the issues this causes, it can reduce the germination. It also, though, reduces the nutrition, weight, and the, ultimately the market value of the crop. And so there are designations uh, provided when you take grain to market that are used. And... One of the big things, I always use corn as an example because most of the grains are similar to corn. But with corn, if you have two live weevils, one live weevil or plus five other live stored grain pests or 10 other live stored grain pests, uh, it will result in a designation that you have an infestation. If you have dead insects, it's not shown here, if you have dead insects, that will also result in a reduction of the sample grade. And so these are things that you try to uh, avoid just so that you can get the most out of your market uh, crops when you go to market them. And if you watched yesterday's talk, one of the big things uh, that Dr. Helving talked about and which also is an issue for insects is moisture. If you store your grain at the proper moisture, you can greatly improve your chances of not having insect issues or just having conditions in the bin change on you. So for corn, the long-term and short-term, the short-term is 15.5%, long-term is 13.5%. Long-term is looking at a year plus. Short-term is typically somewhere in the ballpark of three to six months, it can be a little bit uh, of a variable, but anytime you're planning on longer-term storage, so beyond uh, a few months, that's when you want to really consider making sure you have the moisture. Also is when we need to make sure we're also checking for insects more often. For soybean, it's 14%. For short-term, 12%. Long-term, wheat's 13.5% for the short-term and 12.5% for the long-term. And the moisture should be monitored on a pretty regular basis. So about every time you go to scout the bin, you should be checking for insects as well as the moisture levels. Make sure that there's no unusual uh, growth on the surface. Uh, a lot of times this can be an issue with one of our insect pests. We'll see webbing start to occur on the sides of the bin uh, that touch the grain and then it'll just increase with time. And so uh, if we look at moisture content and the grain temp, what we see is when you have 
uh, lower moisture, lower temperature, uh, you can theoretically store that grain for almost you know, an unlimited amount of time. However, in the real world, we don't have uh, cold temperatures year round. And we also a lot of times can have grain moisture change a little bit on us. So when you are at approximately 15% moisture, an average temperature in the bin uh, with the grain around 40 degrees, you're looking at 879 days. And so that's, that's the optimal. Uh, during the winter, we can get our grain pretty cold. Uh, when you have the fan running on cold days, you can reduce the temperature quite a bit. That's good because that improves the storage time. Uh, and it also is good because you ultimately can reduce the insect pest pressure that you're having or could potentially have. It, this whole table though is to show that as temperatures increase, moisture increases, your allowable time for storage decreases and it starts to decrease pretty rapidly. And so during the summer months, uh, even if you are at optimal moisture content, you can see that you're reducing the time based on the temperature. And grain will stay cold pretty long if you have a full bin, but you can see, uh, especially on those hot summer days that the temperature changes quite a bit. So now we're going to move into our different types of insect feeders. So there's the internal feeders, they're causing the direct damage. These are feeding on or in the kernels. They'll bore holes into the grain as shown in that first, uh, one of those first pictures I had up there. And these can be extremely destructive if left alone. Uh, I've seen where researchers will have these in containers and they have to switch the grain out almost on a monthly basis because uh, a one gallon container with a population of these internal feeders uh, will result in it pretty much just being uh, dust. In a, so it happens pretty quickly. They're very destructive. Some of our most destructive insect pests for stored grain are weevils. Now, weevils get their name uh, and are able to be distinguished from the other insects that you'll find in grain storage based on this right, uh, their snout which uh, if looking at it, it's this elongated portion on the front of their head. Their mouth parts are actually at the end of it. And so you can imagine they can use this snout to really bore into grain. That's what they use it for. And uh, they're typically also pretty hard. Uh, so if you try to squish one, especially these, since they're so small, it's going to be pretty difficult because they have a harder body. The first weevil that we'll talk about is the granary, also known as the wheat weevil. Now, all of the weevils we'll talk about are pretty small. So you'll be able to see them with the naked eye, but uh, they're going to be less than a quarter of an inch most of the time. These wheat weevils or granary, granary weevils will have a polished dark red body. Now this is zoomed in quite a bit, so you won't be able to see all the little hairs on their body. Uh, but it will look like they're kind of pitted like a golf ball, especially on the front portion of their body. You'll notice that more on the back or their elytra here. So their abdomen, their hardened forewings, those little indentations actually form lines. And so it'll look like they'll have lines uh, that run uh, with their body. These do not fly and the larvae and the adults will feed in the grain, but primarily the larvae that cause the problems. The next pest is the maize weevil. Now these are slightly larger than all the other weevil species. These have uh, what we refer to as a densely pitted thorax. So they really look like the golf ball. Everything else without a microscope or being zoomed in, we'll be able to see a little bit of it. These will be very noticeable. These also have yellow to orange spots on their abdomen here. So uh, it doesn't form a complete X, but it looks like the ends of the lines for an X with a, a space in the middle. Again, the adults can also cause some damage to the grain, but it's primarily the larvae that will cause the issues. Uh, the reason I don't have pictures of the larvae up, I should mention for these weevils is that they're pretty small. Uh, they're going to typically be a cream color and when you disturb them, they'll curl up. And so uh, something you might come across, but it's very hard to tell one of the weevil larvae apart from the others. So the easiest way to tell what you have are the adults. 
Next is the rice weevil. These are uh, small, but they do have a shorter snout than the other weevil species. The larvae will feed within the kernels. The adults will use their mouth parts uh, typically to help the larvae get in there. And the life cycle requires high moisture content. So with the rice weevil, if you have increased moisture in the bin, you're increasing your chances of having an issue with these. And a bad infestation of rice weevils also means you have uh, high humidity in the bin, so your grain probably is a little bit too wet to be in for long-term storage. Now we're moving away from uh, just the weevils. Now we're looking at some of the other beetles that we can see in a bin. The next one is the lesser grain borer. Now these are a pest of many different crops. The larvae and the adults can bore into the grain. Uh, and one of the ways, aside from seeing these small beetles uh, in the bin to know that you have a, a population is when you're scouting or looking at the grain, if you're taking the moisture and you start to smell something that's uh, you seem to have a sweet musky odor, that's a sign that you might have this insect pest in the bin. Also, if you have an uh, increased amount of dust or thin, uh, thin brown shells on the grain kernels. So those uh, thin brown shells are a result of the larvae uh, molting. And so uh, when you see those, there's an indication that there's probably a population that's not only present, but it's probably growing uh, over time. And so typically though, the, the odor is what gives these away. Now those were the internal feeders. The next group are the external feeders. Now these will feed on grain dust, crack kernels, other grain debris, or the uh, seed germ. So typically you already have imperfections present in the bin with the grain, which happens, and these will take advantage of that. In some instances, you can have an internal population and an external feeder population present in the bin and you get a vicious cycle where the internal feeders are providing food for the external feeders and you uh, have a result in which you just have a lot more issues. We typically don't see that. However, uh, if grain's being stored in uncovered wagons, especially outside, uh, we have seen issues where people have brought in samples and there's a lot going on. So probably the two most common external feeders are the red flower beetle and the confused flower beetle. And I have them both up on one slide because without the untrained eye, these two are nearly indistinguishable. And so a lot of times they just get grouped together because they also have very similar habits and cause the similar issues in the bin. So these are small red beetles. And I should note, these uh, have very small uh, little pits on their body. They won't really be too noticeable. Uh, this is uh, greatly zoomed in in these pictures. These feed on crack kernels as well as dust. And so uh, one of the issues we see is if grains put into the bin uh, and there's excess dust or it isn't uh, clean for long-term storage, we typically see these beetles show up. Also, these are some of the beetles that uh, after you empty a bin out, you'll, if you take the floor out and clean, uh, if you can for your bin, these are the ones you'll notice most often underneath the floor of the bin, those grates, uh, just because that's where most of your dust settles throughout the year. These will give off an unpleasant odor when they're present in the grain. So a lot of times that's one of the ways that they're determined to be present uh, before you even notice that you are seeing the little beetles. Now, this is a little bit harder. It says here that infested grain will have a gray appearance. Typically, you need to have a pretty large population because this gray appearance is due to the dust uh, and also just their activities of moving around. So uh, not as common, but it is possible to see that as well. Now this next one, the sawtooth grain beetle is probably the easiest one to identify from everything else. It gets its name, uh, not because it has amazing teeth on the front of its head, but actually because it looks like it has saw blades on each side of its thorax here. 
And so even though these are pretty small, about a tenth of an inch, uh, when you see that middle portion of their body and see those little projections that look like saw teeth, it, it makes it pretty easy to identify them right away. These are red in color and they feed primarily on crack kernels. So uh, we do see these in South Dakota from time to time. The next beetle is the Cadell beetle. Uh, we're getting into our larger stored grain pests now. So most of the things we've talked about up to this point are pretty small. Uh, the Cadell beetle is a little over a half an, half an inch long. So typically they are 0.6, but there can be some variation there. The adults typically are black or dark red as shown in the picture. The larvae are cream colored. They will have a dark head and then the end of their body will also be dark. And so these sometimes uh, look like you have a grub almost in the grain, but it's the Cadell beetles. One of the things with Cadell beetles, we don't worry about it so much with most of our storage systems today, uh, but when grain used to be stored in wood uh, with wood uh, sides, these will bore into wood surfaces. It actually made it easier in some instances to know what you were dealing with because you could see where they were uh, causing issues with the storage when they bore into the wood surface. Uh, in some instances, if you're feeding cattle, you can see these, uh, if you have an area where you store the grain separate from the bin, uh, you can actually see these in things like feeders. And so uh, if you notice that you're having damage to your wood surfaces, uh, it'll look like you have kind of lines starting. Uh, and you notice that you have a lot of black beetles scurrying around in the grain or under, if you have buckets or pails, uh, they'll typically be under those. And so when you move them, they'll start moving around them. And so those are signs that you have your Cadell beetle infestation. Now the next pest are mealworms. Uh, the mealworms refer to the larvae themselves and you won't uh, believe it or not, a lot of people actually uh, eat these. They'll put them in food. Uh, we do not so much here in the US. The adults of mealworms are referred to as darkling beetles. Uh, there's two types of mealworms that you can find. There's the uh, yellow mealworm and the dark mealworm. The yellow one is just a larvae with a lighter appearance. Uh, the darker one, as you can see in the images, is a little bit darker in appearance. Now these will feed on broken, damp, or moldy grain. Typically, they can survive uh, months without food. Uh, when they are present, though, you, they're pretty noticeable because these larvae are pretty large. These are pretty large uh, beetles. So about the same size as the Cadell, somewhere in that 0.6 to 0.7 of an inch range. Uh, and so these are pretty noticeable when they're present. One of the things with the adults is that Unlike a lot of other insects, uh, when you step on them, uh, there's going to be more of a noticeable crunch or maybe they won't even die because uh, darkling beetles are very tough. Uh, they have a thicker exoskeleton than most of the other insects and especially of other beetles. And so uh, it makes them more resilient and a little bit uh, tougher to kill with uh, maybe the bottom of your boot. And so now we're up to the Indian meal moth. Uh, of all the insects that might infest stored grain, I think the Indian meal moth is probably the easiest one to identify. Uh, I mentioned that some of them can be detected due to the smells they give off. Uh, alternatively, you can just observe the adults or the larvae in the bin. Indian meal moths are the ones that produce the silk webbing. And so when the larvae are present in the bin, when you start seeing silk webbing appear, it's a pretty much giveaway that you have an Indian meal moth population. Alternatively, if you see a lot of the moths, uh, the adults flying around or on the sides of the bin, it's probably also a good indication that you have population and likely a problem with these. So the moths themselves are pretty small. They're going to have a light brown band on their wings and they typically sit like this with their wings closed. Uh, when they're not flying. And they have darker segments up by their head. They'll have a darker segment at the tip of their wings, but they'll also have 
another, it's a third color of light brown. So this is almost tan. This is a lighter brown at the tips of their wings. If they've been flying around a lot or are damaged, uh, you won't be able to tell the coloration on the wings quite as much uh, because those scales will come off. Or if you grab one with your hand, it will make it a little bit tougher to identify. The larvae, however, are cream colored with a light brown head. So the Cadell beetles have a dark brown head and a dark brown segment at the end of their body. The Indian meal moth are light brown with a light brown segment. So the head and end of the body are lighter colored but the majority of the body is still cream colored. Indian meal moths will feed on the surface of broken grains. And so typically we'll see an infestation of these start at the top of a bin or at the top of the container. And the larvae may be burrowing a little bit further down, but most of their webbing will start on the top. Now that webbing can cause a lot of issues and I'll put this picture up again. So. Uh, one of the things that will do is it traps additional dust, but it can also cause changes to the temperature uh, in the grain because you're going to attract moisture wherever that webbing is. And so these can cause a lot of issues. Uh, and one of the other things I like about this picture, aside from showing how much webbing they can make in a small container, is that you can see they can have very large populations. So this was an almond can. Uh, they can have very large populations in a very small area. So you can imagine in a grain bin, uh, you could be thinking about uh, thousands to hundreds of thousands of these uh, larvae, these caterpillars uh, being present. So that's where you get that extreme amount of webbing. So what do we do? We talked a lot about the types of feeding these insects will do, the insects themselves, but what do we do if a grain bin is infested? Well, there's a few things. Uh, we're going to go through everything except for the word that's in red because I like to try to avoid that one if possible. Uh, however, the issue we run into is a lot of times logistics prevent us from doing these other methods. So the top recommendation is to run the grain through a cleaner and then put it into another bin that was treated with a, a pre-binning Insecticide, a lot of times when you're moving the grain that's already infested, it's recommended that you also uh, treat it with an insecticide as you're binning it. However, a lot of times when we find out the grains infested is in the middle of the winter, and so there's a little bit of a reluctancy to actually stop and move the grain because, well, I, I can't blame anyone. It's cold out. You don't want to stand there and watch the grain move through a cleaner all day. So those are your first two options is to clean move or move the grain and then treat it with a protectant as you're doing that. A third option is to, if you see a small infestation, this isn't if you have a severe infestation, if you see some insects and you're not noticing a lot of issues with the grain itself, so you're not seeing a lot of damaged grain, you can turn your bin fans on if you have them, especially in the winter, this works well and try to cool that grain to below 55 degrees Fahrenheit. As I mentioned before, once you get that grain cool enough, so under 55 to about 32 degrees, you're going to slow those insects down. So they're not going to die, but you're going to slow them down. When you drop below 32 to about 25 to 28 degrees, you're really going to slow those insects down in some instances, you might actually start to cause some mortality, so you're killing them. However, insects are very resilient. And so a lot of times, if you think about when we get our first frost of the year, you'll go outside and there's still insects. And that's because when insects have even a little bit of an area to hide in where there's warmth, they'll be able to tolerate those colder temperatures. So ideally, you'd have to get the grain below probably 20 to 20 20 to 25 degrees before you're going to really see uh, killing off those insects. If you have livestock, you can feed the grain that's infested. The insects uh, won't cause any issues and they're actually just added protein. You can sell the grain at a reduced price. Uh, even if you go through, if you have a severe infestation, it's important to remember, even if you go through and clean it, move it, treat it, if you already have a lot of damage done to the kernels, you're likely still going to get docked. 
The big thing with the cleaning is if you have a lot of the adults or larva present, you will probably remove those so you'll not have as many of the carcasses and so you won't have as much foreign debris, which can uh, also cause you to have a docked grain price. The last option that I list is fumigation. So if you have a severe infestation, you can fumigate. However, uh, tomorrow, I believe it is, Connie Strunk will talk a little bit more about fumigation. The issue with fumigants is that they work the best during warm, humid conditions. Everything we've talked about up to this point is getting your grain cold and to have reduced moisture, so no humidity if possible. Fumigants begin acting as soon as you open up the container, whether it's the uh, little tube or if it's in the little pouch. As soon as you tear that open and air hits those tablets, they begin to work. Uh, they don't work as well in the middle of winter because the air is drier, but during the summer, uh, within seconds, you'd have an intolerable amount of the chemical present uh, in terms of it would cause an issue for you as well. So I don't like fumigation as much in the middle of the winter just because it doesn't work the best. Uh, and so there's also, though, an issue with safety. And so these fumigants are very hazardous. And if you don't have an air supplied respirator while you're throwing them into the bin, even in that short amount of time, uh, you can still have some health issues arise. A few years ago, there was an issue where uh, somebody threw these underneath uh, their hat, living, living quarters and they caused serious issues for their whole family. And then also the rescue personnel that came to try to help. So these are very hazardous. If you do decide to fumigate a bin, please be careful. So aside from also treating, there are some other things we can talk about for preventing. Uh, so now we're jumping from treatment to prevention, a little bit backwards, but uh, for preventing stored grain pests, there's a few things that are really important. The first is storage sanitation. And so this begins before harvest. Ideally, you would empty your bin out and have a little bit of time to make sure you can go through it, and make sure everything's still in good shape. First thing you wanna do is make sure the bin is still weatherproof. Uh, if you can look up and see uh, light either through the sides or the, if you have holes either in the sides or the roof, you probably have a very clear issue. A lot of times though, where we see this weatherproof issue is actually around the door. Uh, it's a little bit tougher. You can't make a bin completely airtight. We need to be able to have some air movement from the outside to the inside. However, uh, we try to minimize uh, openings as much as possible or just make them difficult for insects to get in. But I mentioned most of these insects are very small. So really it's important to clean that bin before you start putting new grain in. And this means typically getting out the broom, cleaning off the sides. Uh, a lot of times I'll recommend people put their shot back in, clean the floor up. You wanna reduce the amount of dust you have in the bin as much as possible, because even if it's sitting empty and it has dust, you will actually attract some of those external feeders into the bin. If you don't clean it out before you put the new grain in, we run into the issue of it's already infested before you uh, put the grain in. And so it's for sure going to be infested then. So I mentioned we want to make sure the bin door is sealed well after it's filled just to try to reduce movement of the insects through there. It's also important to clean up if when you're loading the bin or if you are uh, moving grain out, any spillage around the bin needs to be cleaned up. And the reason for this is, is if you have spills outside, you're going to attract insects to the inside. So once they're in the area, they're going to continue seeking out grain. And so it doesn't matter uh, how much any grain spills can attract these insect pests. And this will seem redundant, but I say keep the bin perimeters clear. Uh, this isn't just grain spills though. Some of these insects can uh, be harbored in weeds, especially if you have weed seeds. They can also seek those out. And so you wanna to try to keep the perimeter, typically I say about 10 feet around the bin, uh, pretty pristine. So you wanna keep uh, any plants to a minimum. 
a lot of times this is easy to do because uh, you might have rocks or gravel around the foundation. You just want to try to keep everything as clean around the bin as you can. Here are some of my storage rules. I didn't come up with these, but I do try to make sure everybody follows them. Storage rule number one, and you'd be surprised this is an issue I run into year after year. Please do not store your new grain on old grain. I can't tell you how many times I get calls because somebody has done this and then they're uh, noticing that they're having heat issues between the layers, especially if the old grain maybe wasn't in perfect condition. If it's even in good condition, we still run into issues though because you might have stored grain insect pests present and then the new grain becomes infested and then you have a whole bin full of an issue. The best way to avoid this is just uh, move the old grain out and then put the new grain in. In some instances, this might not be possible if you decided not to market the grain. So it can be done. However, if you're going to do that, you're probably going to want to put on a top dressing on the old layer, let that dry, and then put the new grain in. And as you're putting the new grain in, treat it with a insecticide. If you have an empty bin, it's a good idea to consider a pre-binning insecticide application after you've already thoroughly cleaned the bin. So you don't want dust in there when you're doing the pre-binning insecticide. And no, you can't use the pre-binning insecticide as a reason for not cleaning the bin out. So I know it's a lot of work and it takes a lot of time, but uh, cleaning is very important because you wanna get rid of all that dust. But the pre-binning insecticide typically is sprayed uh, you don't spray it up to the very top. So it's typically a few rings up. Uh, most of the labels will actually tell you how high you can apply it. Uh, and then you wanna do the floor as well. With doing a pre-binning, you'd want to have on a respirator with uh, acid gas cartridges, organic vapor acid gas cartridges on your respirator, and you'd also want to have protective clothing on. And the reason for that is if you're spraying an insecticide up on the side of the bin, I can guarantee there's going to be some drift down onto your body. But this can greatly reduce your likelihood of having an infestation. So I mentioned over and over uh, treating the grain with an insecticide as it's going into the bin. There are quite a few options on the market. These are protectant insecticides. Uh, Typically, it will take a little bit of a design. Uh, you'll have to get some infrastructure set up uh, to be able to do this and do it effectively and also make sure that you get a good coverage that's uh, to, uh, equal across the grain that's going in. But this can be done at the, at the hopper and then uh, as you're emptying, you can have the grain actually be, being treated. So there's different configurations for this but it's really important if you're going to be doing extended long-term storage. And we already talked about this a little bit, but keep that grain as cool as possible throughout the winter months. Uh, so we can, in South Dakota really take, and even in our neighboring states, take advantage of this because we get cold enough in the winter that we can really reduce the movement and also in some instances kill those insect pests. So that's all I have for everyone today. I again apologize that I was a little delayed in getting started. <coughs> Excuse me. If you need to get a hold of me, my office number is listed here. However, with COVID, uh, it's a little bit harder to reach me at the office as I'm uh, working remote occasionally. Uh, also, my email, I typically respond to emails within a day. If I don't and you've tried to reach me, I apologize. Uh, sometimes things slip through the cracks. However, I try not to let that happen. If you have a stored grain infestation ever and you'd like to send a sample in, uh, you can send it to uh, my name and then Berg Agricultural Hall and it'll get to me uh, and I'll take a look and respond to you. Uh, if you do send in samples, we request that you send them in. Uh, a lot of times, if you remember the old film containers, something similar to that because uh, one of the issues we run into is if insects are put into an envelope as they're going through mail sorters, uh, they get squished. And when we get them, they're a little bit more difficult to identify. So 
Uh, if you do want to send in a sample, uh, sometimes it's also nice to send in a few of the kernels that are damaged, just so I can see what I'm what I'm looking at, not only the pests, but also the damage. It helps to identify some of these because the pictures make them look uh, really nice and easy to tell apart for most of them. But in reality, when they're covered with dust, uh, they all look pretty similar and they're also really small. So uh, that's all I mentioned as I before that I have for you. If you have any questions, I'm actually going to close uh, the talk down uh, so that I can see the rest of the Zoom meeting. Looks like there's one Q&A. Uh, OK, Adam, um, I can read that off for if you can't see it. Um, Scott's asking, when I auger wheat into the bin right from the combine, I notice that the roof is crawling with the brown wheat weevils. How do you prevent that? Uh, that would be where the uh, protectant insecticide applied at the uh, hopper when you're putting the grain into the auger, that would reduce it to some degree. However, uh, in those instances, uh, Scott, I guess I would recommend running that grain through a cleaner first. I know during harvest, we try not to slow things down as much as possible because getting the, the grain out of the field is priority number one. But, uh, you know, if you already have an infestation in the field and you can't treat the grain out in the field because, uh, you know, the pre-harvest intervals on those insecticides uh, limit that from the majority of them. So, and also that would be a lot of added costs. So uh, I guess the best thing to do would be uh, go through and uh, clean the grain and maybe treat it as it's going in because that would reduce the populations to some extent and the cleaning would likely reduce a lot of them. Uh, but yeah, that's, it's, that's a good question. Uh, and I might have to look up some better answers and I'll contact you later, uh, Scott. I believe I'll be able to see your contact information uh, here or shoot me an email. Uh, Great, thanks Adam. And Scott, do we have other questions at this time? Uh, we're waiting. Go ahead, Adam, yep. I didn't know if you saw, yeah, you took care of it, sir. Uh, Scott had an earlier question that just showed up for me, but. Uh, I think we got it. A good catch. Uh, but yeah, the, you know, the biggest thing with grain storage and if you already have the insects and I didn't put it in here because I, I didn't know how many people uh, still are picking corn and then storing it outdoors, but there are some other insect pests, especially for corn. There's one in particular, uh, the ag agmoy grain moth uh, that can cause some issues with that. But typically with these pests, we see them show up in the, in the bins a while after harvest. So uh, Scott, with your issue, that's, that's something I'm not quite as familiar with. We've got another question here from Daniel. Uh, is there an extension publication on the bin sprays and grain protectant products? There isn't at this time. Uh, that is something that I'm working on this winter. Uh, the best thing that it's not as up to date because it was written a few years ago. If you go on to extension.sdstate.edu, our website for extension, let's uh, look up uh, stored grain pests and corn. And there was a chapter that I wrote with uh, Dr. Billy Fuller a couple years ago. Uh, for It applies for corn particularly, but most of these sprays can be used with other grains as well. And it will list those chemicals for you. Uh, but like I said, that's a few years out. And a lot of times, the, uh, especially with uh, the mergers and acquisitions that happened a few years ago, uh, some of those names may have changed. So I was planning on doing an update uh, for that, just to have some of that information out there. We're also working on a stored grain identification guide uh, and it would probably also have some of those recommendations in there as well. So hopefully we have those here at some point in 2021 for you. And those will be available on our website when they, when they get done. I'm guessing we'll have some more questions roll in here. Um, but in the meantime, while folks might be typing, 
Um, I think we will have, I put some details in the chat here. We'll have a poll pop up here in just a minute. And we'd ask you to just take a couple seconds to fill that poll out. Um, that will give us an idea of what you thought of today's presentation and if there's more information that we can provide to you. Um, and again, if you just hold on here a minute, I'm guessing we'll have more questions, but while you fill out that poll, do check the chat out when you have a second. I put the link for recorded sessions and registration. You likely found the registration if you're here today, but that same page will have recorded sessions available. And look for an email from SDSU Extension at the end of the week. Uh, we will be providing you with a survey, and if you would just take a couple minutes to fill that out regarding how you felt about the entire week's worth of topics, we would really appreciate it. That'll help us plan for next time since this is something we've never done before. And I see there's a couple questions popping up here. While the poll is finishing up, I also want to mention the very last link in the chat that um, I posted. There is a chat below me, but if you check out what I put in there, there is a URL for a meeting that we will have following this one. It's completely um, open to any of you interested in a debriefing with Adam or uh, just networking with each other. So you'll have to click on that link to get to that meeting um, and have the informal discussion following this. So a couple more questions we have, Adam. Is the PowerPoint available? Yes, um, if you were taking the poll and maybe didn't hear me, the PowerPoint will be available. This whole session will be is being recorded and that recording will be available at the same link where you registered for this um, event today. So give us some time, but we will have the recordings available. And Scott is wondering, is Temple a good bin spray or what would you recommend, Adam? Uh, I believe you can use Temple. Uh, a lot of times, depend, uh, just depending on the pest, uh, my recommendation is often melathion. However, there are quite a few other active ingredients out there. Uh, depending on what you're looking at, uh, is more of an issue. So if you're thinking about doing a top dressing, it's important and off the top of my head, I can't think of a lot of those insecticide names, but it's important to make sure that uh, when you're looking for something that you can treat, if you're doing a top dressing, uh, you'd want to do, make sure that's on the label because for some of these, they'll be listed as only a pre-binning or maybe uh, as a protectant plus a top dressing. And so, sorry, I don't have a better answer right now. Uh, when we move into the next uh, session, Scott, if you wanna go into there, I can pull up that document and uh, actually I'll see if I can do that right now, Sarah, and see if I can throw that into the chat uh, just so everybody can okay. see. Sounds great. Hopefully my computer works for this. <laughs> It hasn't well, Adam's else today. <laughs> <laughs> no, we got you. We could hear you. We could see the slides. It turned out fine. Um, you should be getting a survey at the end of the week from us. If you could just take a couple minutes and fill that out, that'll let us know what you thought of our stored grain topic and the webinar series. Um, we will continue this series through the end of March to every Tuesday through Friday at 10 a.m. So feel free to join us um, anytime you're interested. You can register by the week on our website, that, and that is the same place you can find the recordings for these sessions. It looks like he's still typing there. Um, in the meantime, we really appreciate you joining today and please join us for the informal discussion afterward. That link is the Zoom link you'll find in the chat. It should be available right now. Are there any more questions? I'll give it a couple minutes just in case we have some Q&A. So I just threw the link for the, it's a PDF, but that's the chapter for the corn best management practices and it covers stored grain pests of corn. Uh, most of those will co be covered, uh, that we covered today will be present in there because they can all feed on corn. Uh, the other thing though will be, uh, there are a list of pre-binning uh, insecticides and protectant insecticides uh, that can be used. And just looking at my list uh, on this publication, I don't see tempo, but I'm pretty sure it's labeled. So I, I need to look that up. 
I think Adam, you and I actually worked on this uh, this summer, and um, we use Tempo. I remember oh, okay. personally. Yep. I use Tempo. Right. We, it depended on the label, but I remember we found, uh, depending on the pest and the label, that we could use some Tempo. Yeah, Tempo, tempo is SC. listed. So uh, it's only for pre binning residual spray, though. So uh, right. when you're going into those uh, more of the protectant type, uh, then you have a little bit of limitation. There are some options that, uh, depending on your setup, if you're trying to avoid using something that's uh, hazardous to your health. Uh, there are some different options. Uh, one of them is using its, uh, we all know BT and corn uh, for corn rootworms, but there's also BT sprays that we can use that can affect these, uh, some of these insects. So, but it, uh, those are pretty targeted. So the BT is only good against Indian meal moth. And uh, there's also, uh, what's referred to as diatomaceous earth. However, uh, when thinking about that, uh, typically you have to then run the grain through a grain cleaner just because as it sounds, it's, it's just very coarse dirt, essentially. It's, uh, but it is very effective against the larva because it, it scratches them and causes them to uh, essentially bleed and then they die. So there are quite a few options though on that link I sent. Uh, I don't believe I've listed out all the fumigants and uh, if you are, yeah, I do have the fumigants in there too. If you are interested in doing fumigation, uh, the talk, I, it is tomorrow, correct, Sarah? So that, yes. that would be a talk to join in on just to see, uh, learn a little bit about the safety and some of the precautions you need to take when using those products. Great. Well, I think um, we, if, if there are no further questions, we really appreciate everyone joining us today and um, appreciate the polling response that gives us an idea of how we can continue to make these webinars effective. And of course, there's always room for improvement. So thanks, Adam, for joining us. And for anyone that's interested in an informal discussion or a debrief, you can use the meeting URL that I posted in the chat. Um, hold on, we have one last Q&A. Uh, Adam, is there anything good like phosphium pellets for bin storage? Or is, excuse me, is there anything as good as phosphium pellets for bin storage? Uh, well, that's, I don't believe those are available anymore. And one of the reasons is that, uh, Uh, well, no, maybe they are. So uh, the, there is still the phos toxin insecticide, which is it's aluminum phosphide is the active ingredient. So if I, I'm not sure if those are the ones you're thinking of, uh, but uh, aluminum phosphide or uh, also uh, magnesium phosphide are probably going to be the most effective uh, out of the different active ingredients. There are a lot of different products available. Uh, you're going to see different names uh, with those, but uh, aluminum phosphide is the most commonly used, I believe, and that's because it, it is very effective, but uh, it is also very, very hazardous. So uh, I, I believe, uh, believe that would be your best option. The problem with that is if it's not the right temperature, and humidity, uh, you can run into some issues. So right on their labels, they uh, most of the fumigants will say not to use them if the temperature is below 40 degrees Fahrenheit. And that's just because they will not work well. And so you're wasting money. Uh, and uh, if there's low humidity, that also can play a major uh, part in that. So uh, I'll, I'll try not to get too much into fumigants though. Uh, so. I don't want to take too much away from tomorrow's talk, but uh, you know the the best thing to do with those is to wait. Probably do those in the on warmer days, but also uh, in the springs probably the best when we start getting some humidity and warmer temperatures. But I would say anything with aluminum phosphide would probably be uh, the best option for that.
All right. Well, if there are no further questions, um, hopefully we'll see some of you tomorrow or in our debriefing session uh, that is open now to join. So thank you all and we will see you soon. Have a great day.